Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the Implementation Projects Preparation Event for the 22nd session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I'm Ellie Thurston, and I'm the American Indian Law Program Fellow at the University of Colorado Law School. And I'm just going to share a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be shared after the event for anyone who has to leave early or wasn't able to make it. And I'll be available through the chat if anyone has any technical issues. Don't hesitate to re reach out. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie, and greetings, everyone. I'm Kristen Carpenter, a professor at the University of Colorado, where I direct the American Indian Law Program. I'm also co-lead with Sue Noe of the Implementation Project. Sue is a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund, and the project is a joint initiative of NARF and Colorado Law to advance education and advocacy regarding the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Part and parcel of that work is making sure that American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians have access to and the tools to participate at the United Nations when it meets about Indigenous peoples' issues. I'd like to thank our team, especially Ellie Thurston, whom you just heard from, Mason Estes, and Teresa Coberly, as well as our amazing speakers, Chief Ben Barnes, Andrea Carmen, and Jeff Roth, um, for being with us here today. And now I'll turn it over to uh, my partner in crime, Sue Noe, Senior Staff Attorney at the Native American Rights Fund, who will moderate the event. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks, Ellie. And uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Uh, we're really excited to have this opportunity uh, to learn from the, our speakers who have um, a lot of experience to share with us, a lot of practical information and uh, information about strategy that can really help us to have effective participation at Permanent Forum. And I hope many of you um, watching today will be attending the forum this year or perhaps attending in a future year. Um, I'm gonna go right ahead and start uh, introducing our speakers. As Ellie mentioned, we'll have Q&A after the presentations. And in addition to putting your questions in the chat, people, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you um, at that time. Um, so our first speaker today is Chief Ben Barnes, who is the chief of the Shawnee tribe. Chief Barnes' framework of understanding stems not only from the vantage of political office, but from a traditional cultural framework of belonging to the White Oak ceremonial stomp ground, a place where the traditional religion for the Shawnee people is practiced. Having witnessed firsthand the struggle of community elders working to ensure the continued survival of the Shawnee religion and language, it's from this deep and personal connection that upholding the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and human rights activism have become cornerstones of the Shawnee tribe's government. Chief Barnes' tenure as the elected chief of the Shawnee tribe began in 2019. Immediately upon taking office, Chief Barnes declared a state of emergency for the Shawnee language. Subsequently, in accord with UNESCO's efforts of the International Year and Decade of Indigenous Languages, the Shawnee tribe named 2020 the Year of the Shawnee Language, and in 2021 began the Decade of the Shawnee Language. Chief Barnes attended the UN Permanent Forum last year and delivered a powerful statement concerning boarding schools and the need for full remedy, reconciliation, and truth-telling. It's an honor to have Chief Barnes with us today to share his experiences and insights as a tribal leader participating in the forum. So I turn it over to you, Chief Barnes, sir. Thank you, Sue, for that introduction. And thank you, Kristen. On behalf of the Shawnee tribe, I want to give, uh, I appreciate being here and our history here as uh, international diplomats and engaging in international conversations is nothing new. So we have had relationships either formal relationships with European powers or treaties with six nations, France, England, Spain, uh, Mexico, Republic of Texas, and of course, United States. And, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be here with, I believe, Jeff is a member of the uh, Haudenosaunee, and we have the International Indian Treaty Council with, with Andrea Carmen. So these, just by that very nature, it's an international scope that of our, of our conversation. But I'm sitting here today at the Osage Nation, and we're so several nations are here and we're talking with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the United States talking about human trafficking. Uh, 
And so there's a lot of issues affects Indian country, not just for those in Oklahoma or in other areas that are not next to international borders. Issues that Paspayaki has on the southern border or our Haudenosaunee brothers on the on the northern border, they have international relations as as a Another example might be Scallum Jamestown, with the previous administration canceling all their exports of salmon to Chinese markets. So we do have international concerns, and this is nothing new for Indian country. We've always been international in scope. And just like, and sovereignty is one of those things, if you're not using it, it's not, it's not, what use is sovereignty if you're not using it? And sovereignty is not given out. Sovereignty, justice equity, fairness in the law, those things are never given freely. It has to be sought. It has to be used like a muscle. So if it doesn't, if you're not using it, it atrophies. So for the Shawnee tribe, our participation in our first permanent forum last year was a, kind of a culture shock for me because I didn't understand the United Nations. I didn't under, fully understand the speed at which the or I should say maybe the lack of speed that the United Nation moves. You know, we know that Indian country moves relatively slow, but it's a whole new vocabulary and vernacular. But I'm reminded by the efforts of people like Philip Deere, when they went to United Nations, when they were talking about their rights as people, their rights to have worship, their rights to make sure that our ancestors was not disturbed from the soil. Those led to Religious Freedom Act. Those led to the acts of NAGPRA. So, it's these lessons that I hearken to and I listen to. I, what they have done is, you know, we're sowing the seeds of the future. And this was no more apparent to me than a few years ago. I was driving down the highway with my daughter. And there was a gentleman off the side of the highway in a pecan grove. And they had these five-gallon buckets with these little seedlings, these little pecan seedlings. And my daughter pointed out. This gentleman will never see those pecans bear any fruit, bear any nuts, but he was still doing the work. And so for some of us, I wonder what Philip Deere and those others that went to the United Nations, what they would think about self-governance, what they would think about Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act, what they would think about the, not only our religious communities, our traditional communities thriving, you know, but now that, that sovereignty, we're re-engaging at very high levels with foreign countries and with international with international agencies. And as Kristen, as as uh, Sue pointed out, my tribe took some of those lessons from UNESCO with International Year of Indigenous Languages, International Decade of Indigenous Languages, and that helped us bring an awareness to our language campaigns to reinstill and reinvigorate our language program. And now. Uh, as la in last year, January of last year, we had what amounted to 4% of our tribal nation enrolled in a language restoration program, which is a, a hugely important. We have people now that are once again speaking the language. Young people are speaking the language. Young people are being looked at as if they're elders because their elders forgot the language. And it's the young people that are reinvigorating our cultures. But for me, I think probably one of the most important aspects of the United Nations was the work that was done through the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the articles therein. Using the DRIP as a framework for my own understandings of what a Shawnee system of justice needs to look like. There were long conversations with friends, colleagues, particularly uh, Judge Gregory Bigler from the, from the uh, Uchi, which is part of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And one of the comments he made is, if you want to have a tribal court, why does your court need to look like that of the court of Oklahoma, or the court of the United States? Should it not reflect Shawnee people and Shawnee values? And that is absolutely, absolutely correct, because I don't want to be decolonized. I want to re shawnee the world. I want to take our ideas. I want to take our sensibilities and incorporate that into the way that we act as a government. So from long conversations on how we can implement the DRIP into our laws, these they're starting to bear fruit today with the victim services, justice services, trying to not focus so much on uh, more of a restorative justice rather than on, on one that's yeah, really seems to be more, more in line with enforcement. That's not our values. Our values is keeping families together as, as best we can. So because, and I also think that these conversations are important. 
So when we're having these conversations about codifying laws and what it means to be Shawnee or what it means to be whatever nation you are, if you're having a hard time articulating what it means to be Shawnee, if you're having a hard time articulating, if you're having a hard time articulating that this is these are the things, if we lose them, we would no longer be Shawnee then how would you ever explain that to the state of Oklahoma, the state of Kansas, the state of Kentucky, or to the United States? If you can't articulate these ideas to your own people, then what hope do you have in articulating these ideas at a much higher level with people who have no idea who and where the Shawnee come from? But these are, when we espouse these ideas about human rights, about a full truth-telling on account, on and an accounting of boarding school experience and how they try to destroy our cultures and languages. When we insist upon that, these also become international pressure points for our partners like the United States to apply pressures on those perennial uh, bad actors around the globe, whether it's Russia, Iran, China, or anyone else that sends their children to re-education centers. I just remember just a few weeks ago, I was uh, extremely triggered when I saw uh, Russia prayed out these Ukrainian children and thanked their uncle Yuri from liberating them from the oppressive tyranny of their parents and grandparents. And they were looking down their nose on Ukrainian culture and history and Ukrainian language. And I wondered, is that how our kids came home? Looking down on our big grandparents, looking down on our tradition, our religion, our language. And I can't but conclude that's that that that's that is the evil of re-education centers and boarding schools. And for my people, I want a full accounting of the damage that was done to us. And I think it's through this effort, this work by attending the United Nations helps me articulate those conversations about why it's necessary and why the United States, the United States best interests to be the leaders in the, in the, to be leaders in the world on these issues. Because if the United States can articulate to the rest of the world, how it's tidied up its house and its house is in order, how can they possibly have that conversation with China, Iran, and, and China? So the difficulty, you know, there are some difficulties in participation. As I mentioned, you know, the vernacular that people use at the United Nations can be difficult. The registration system, we was all making jokes earlier about how the reg registration system is, uh, can be a little bit of a pain, but it's not insurmountable. Tribal nations could and should participate at this international level. The conversations we're having are important, whether they're around the human trafficking issues, whether they're around security of our borders, or whether they're about full truth-telling and accounting of boarding school activities as, as perpetuated by the United States, even unto this very day. But I also want to remind people, don't be overly frustrated by the, by the United Nations. When we were walking in, I remember seeing Chuck Hoskin from the Cherokee Nation walking in, and his GDP at Cherokee Nation exceeds a lot of the member nations who have placards permanently there in the United Nations chambers. So I remind tribal leaders, the system wasn't built by us. It wasn't built for us. So we do have to be mindful that it's not going to reflect our values, but it is a place. It is a garden of ideas. It's a place where we can sow seeds for a better future for our people and secure further human rights and secure inherent rights for our people. Thank you very much for this invitation. And on behalf of the Shawnee people, I hope to see you in New York. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Barnes, for those remarks and, um, and for taking time out of your important work there at the Osage Nation today to, um, to be here with us and, and share your experiences and uh, insights with us. Um, you know, I wanted to just highlight um, your description of this international engagement as an exercise of tribes' sovereignty. And I think that's a really important point. Um, and also, you know, that things at the international level within the UN, things do take a longer amount of time. Um, you have to have the long view uh, for those efforts to bear, to bear fruit. Um, but then also how the international advocacy can as well impact developments at the national level with laws like NAGPRA that you highlighted. Um, and then also your um, uh, description of how tribes themselves can look to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, to inform tribes' own laws and systems of government. 
Uh, and then finally, why it's important for the um, US to be a leader on these issues, um, for the US to have credibility in the international arena. And I think that's an, an important point that we need to highlight again and again with uh, folks at the US who are engaging with us um, at Permanent Forum. So now I'm going to turn to our next speaker, Andrea Carmen. Um, she's of the Yaki Nation, and she's the executive director of the International Indian Treaty Council, a position she's held since 1992. Um, Ms. Carmen has many years of experience working as a human rights trainer and observer around the world and was the International Indian Treaty Council's team leader for work on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 1997, she was one of two Indigenous representatives invited to formally address the UN General Assembly for the first time in history at the UN Earth Summit Plus Five. In 2006, Ms. Carmen was a rapporteur for the UN Expert Seminar on Indigenous Peoples' Permanent Sovereignty over Natural Resources and Their Relationship to Land, the first time an Indigenous woman had been selected to serve as a rapporteur for a UN Expert Seminar. She's been an expert presenter at UN bodies and seminars addressing numerous issues, including human rights, treaties and treaty rights, biological diversity, food sovereignty, UN Sustainable Development Goals, Climate Change, Reproductive and Intergenerational Health, International Repatriation and Cultural Rights, Indigenous Languages and the Rights of the Child. In 2010, she became a member of the Global Steering Committee for the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, which coordinates Indigenous Peoples work with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In 2018, she was selected by indigenous peoples, tribes, and organizations in North America to serve as their representative on the facilitative working group for the development of the UNFCCC, local communities, and indigenous peoples traditional knowledge exchange platform for its first three years of operation. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit in on the Cultural Survival Project Access UN Permanent Forum training, I think it was last week, and got a preview there of all the great historical, contextual, and practical information that Ms. Carmen has to share related to impactful advocacy at the international level. I'm very glad that we all have the opportunity to learn from her today. So I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Carmen. Thank you very much. And thank you also to Chief Barnes for mentioning my nation, Pasco Yaqui tribe. I'm here in Tucson, Arizona, and we are an international nation, as all nations are, of indigenous peoples. Uh, we have uh, six in, uh, communities, including a federally recognized reservation here in Southern Arizona. And we have eight traditional governments, unbroken traditional governments, um, in our territories in um, Sonora, Mexico, and we're the only indigenous nation that has a treaty with the Mexican government, a nation to nation treaty um, that was uh, established in 1939. Um, I wanted to talk about the permanent forum, and I was really glad uh, for some of the comments that Chief Bards made, including that we have struggled and worked for every single advance that we've made uh, at the United Nations, I think same here as home. And it's important to remember in this context that we are entering in, even though it's called uh, indigenous issues. Um, we'll have an opening ceremony by the indigenous peoples of that land. Uh, but it is a body of the United Nations, of the settler governments, many of whom are creating uh, the struggles that we are facing in our homelands, not just here, but around the world. So this is a, a picture I want to remind you, um, all of you who will be attending, that this will be televised. So not only when you're reading, but when you're sitting next to people that are reading, please uh, don't fall asleep or pick your nose. Um, you will be on camera around the world. And this is uh, me with two of our young Indigenous representatives, one from the Hopi Nation, uh, one from uh, Oglala Lakota that attended with us last year. And however old you are, youth or elder, uh, it's very important that we continue to have new participation, uh, bringing new vision and uh, new experiences into these United Nations processes. So I welcome you all um, at this time. 
As Chief Barnes mentioned, you know, I'm glad he mentioned one of our founders of the International Indian Treaty Council, uh, Philip Deere, who's there in front leading the delegation of Indigenous nations into the United Nations for the first time back in 1977. And this was envisioned when the International Indian Treaty Council was formed to take our treaty rights as nations and uh, our other human rights struggles into the family of nations uh, for the first time. It took us three years uh, to organize this first conference, but these are some of the delegates there, mainly from the Americas and mainly from North America um, is how this work was born. And now uh, it includes indigenous peoples from around the world. The, inter the permanent forum is the second largest uh, UN body in the whole UN system um, followed, uh, following the uh, Convention on the Elimination of um, Discrimination Against Women, CEDA sessions. But one of the calls of this first 1977 conference uh, focused on discrimination against Indigenous peoples of the Americas in Geneva was a call for not just uh, a United Nations standard recognizing Indigenous peoples' collective rights uh, rather than, uh, or in addition to the individual human rights that um, we uh, are accorded as, as humans. Uh, our rights are exercised collectively, our land rights, our freedom of religion, our language, our self-determination are expressed collectively. And of course, this became the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But they also call for a body, which there was none at that time, uh, addressing rights of Indigenous peoples. And that became what was called the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations. Populations was the best we could get at that time. Um, of course, one of the 30-year struggles for the UN Declaration was to be recognized as peoples with the international right of self-determination. But at that time, uh, we began to recognize that we just had a working group. It was fairly low in the UN system structure and that we really needed to start talking about some kind of permanent body. And sure enough, uh, the working group was, uh, was abolished in 2006 when the Commission on Human Rights uh, was also abolished, its parent body, um, and became the Human Rights Council. And we, uh, achieved uh, three different bodies out of that process. One was the UN Special Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, who will be at the upcoming permanent forum, Francisco Kalitzai. Another one was the body in Geneva that um, succeeded the working group, which is Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They also will be there and there will be an interactive session with them and the rapporteur. But the, the last was the UN Permanent Forum on uh, Indigenous Issues. Please note that even though the international arena recognizes us as peoples, we're still called issues in the Permanent Forum. Um, so it's something we keep raising um, to, to change. Maybe, maybe we'll achieve it this year. So the Permanent Forum was established in 2001. Um, and this is the, the official mandate. Mandate is what all UN bodies have, and that's what the United Nations says they are supposed to do. Uh, the Permanent Forum shall serve as an advisory body to the Council, it says. That's the UN Economic and Social Council. It has a mandate to discuss Indigenous issues within the mandate of the Council relating to economic and social development, culture, the environment, education, health, and human rights. So you can see it has a broad mandate. Uh, this is a picture of one of the regional caucuses, the Abiyayala or Latin America Caribbean Indigenous Peoples Caucus. And in doing so, I will make this slideshow available. I don't need to read every word. It will provide expert advice and recommendations to ECOSOC um, and throughout the UN system. And this is very important because those of us that uh, work in different UN bodies, we know we have to be at all of these places, whether the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, Convention on Biodiversity, 
the Human Rights Council. So this is our chance to really improve the way that all of these bodies throughout the UN system address our rights and include our participation. We also get to raise awareness and promote coordination of activities and prepare and disseminate information. This is uh, a picture back in 2007 of Shoshone Elder Carrie Dan addressing the permanent forum. Now, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I want to highlight a few things for you because um, the United Nations system, as Chief Barnes said, takes a long time. It took us 30 years, literally 30 years, to get the UN Declaration adopted that we could accept as the minimum standard. It isn't the ceiling, but it is the floor, and it's a strong one that we didn't have before. So we wanted the UN Permanent Forum to have a higher level placement in the UN system than the working group did, all the way right under one of the main principal bodies, uh, which is the Economic and Social Council based in New York. Uh, we wanted it to be permanent, not a working group, and it was created as a permanent forum. Uh, and we wanted for half the experts to be nominated by Indigenous peoples, and uh, we achieved that. There are 16 members, and eight members are nominated by Indigenous peoples around the world, um, all the regions, and eight are selected by the states. Um, or nominated by the states. And we wanted it, and this is, we got all those things. Um, there was some debate about whether all of the members should be nominated by indigenous peoples. And, but we thought that if we did that, our um, work there would probably be diminished knowing the, the UN system. That if we had a body that was half nominated by indigenous peoples and half nominated by countries, is, is what states mean when you talk at the UN, <laughs> sorry. Doesn't mean like Oklahoma or California, it means the United States of America and Canada, et cetera. We wanted it to have a strong mandate. We wanted it to have the ability to go into situations where indigenous people's rights were being violated by countries. And we did not get that. It's an advisory body. Um, and we also wanted to be called Indigenous Peoples, especially after the General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration, but as I mentioned, we're still issues. So what is the permanent forum and what is it not? Uh, it's an advisory body made up of 18 independent experts, and we're going to be hearing uh, from our independent expert representing Indigenous Peoples in North America in just a little bit, Jeffrey Roth, but it's important to recognize these are not representatives of indigenous peoples. These are called independent experts. Same with the states, they're supposed to be independent. So you can use any of the permanent forum members. You don't just have to work with um, the member from our body if another one is focused on the issue that you care about um, in particular. It's an opportunity for networking with indigenous peoples, UN agencies, funders, states or countries. Um, very important that you approach the United States of America. The State Department will be sitting there. Ask them, don't ask them, do they have time to talk to you? Ask them, what's a good time to sit down and have coffee? So you can talk to representatives of the UN State Department there that are hard to get to you know, from within the United States. You can build awareness, get your issue out there and known. It's a place to learn about and impact the UN system where you might want to focus on in, in your tribal nations uh, areas of interest. You can learn about other struggles and it's also a place for at least a lot of the representatives to make short three minute statements that is tied to the agenda. So make sure you study the agenda. Um, and it's you need to be very strategic. Uh, and when I say three minutes, I mean three minutes. It's not like the old days where the chair will say, please conclude your statement. Your mic will go dead at three minutes. So you need to practice, right? You don't want your big finale to be cut off. What is it not? It is not a human rights complaint body. They are not going to address your individual situation of a mind that you're fighting. They might address the issue in general of indigenous peoples uh, fighting extractive industries, and you can use your uh, specific case as an example. 
So it's uh, not a place to denounce specific state actions. I would stay away from that, even though the phrase, for example, in the United States or in Mexico, you know, we're facing this to show um, a better a better understanding of the issues you're talking about. And also like the whole UN system, it's not a place to expect quick or immediate results. Um, the human rights bodies will be there, especially the UN Special Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Francisco Calizai, very close friend of mine. He was the board president of IITC for 20 years. He's Mayan Kachikel. He speaks English, though. And you can make appointments to meet with him. And that's where you're going to raise your specific human rights situation. There also will be a chance in one of the agenda items for dialogue uh, with the Special Rapporteur. Um, the UN Declaration recognizes the key role of the UN Permanent Forum to implement and follow up on the UN Declaration. So they ask that the theme, um, but also all of your interventions tie into at least one article of the UN Declaration will make it more effective. This is a picture of the current um, membership of the UN Permanent Forum. And we're finding now that more and more countries or states uh, also um, nominate indigenous peoples from their uh, countries to participate, even though they're there officially as independent experts from states. Um, we have seven regions, but eight seats on the permanent forum. So it was decided a long time ago that Africa, Latin America, um, and Asia that have the most numbers of indigenous peoples, they say, um, will rotate that last seat every three years. I think I already went over that they're independent experts, um, but don't think that we get to choose our members. Uh, we get to nominate, but it's, it's the president of the UN Economic and Social Council, which is a, represent, a representative of country that makes the final selection. Sometimes they select the nominee that indigenous peoples from the various regions want, and sometimes they don't. So the, the regions are Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and Russian Federation, uh, North America, that's our region, of course, Pacific and the Arctic. Um, I was asked to say, what can the permanent forum actually do for us? Because I know a lot of indigenous peoples go there with high hopes that they're gonna solve all their problems. Others, you know, are disgusted um, quickly because they're not gonna address your specific situation. However, with perseverance, and a dedicated uh, indigenous peoples, your own people to follow through uh, on the issues that can be raised, you can make results. And I'm gonna give a one quick example that um, Kristen was very close with us on when she was chair of the UN Expert Mechanism on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's the issue of international repatriation. Our sacred items and human remains are being held in museums, universities, private collections, auction houses all over the world. And there is no mechanism. Even though the UN Declaration Article 12 called for the creation of a mechanism with states and indigenous peoples for the return of our items, it never has been implemented to this day. The World Conference on Indigenous Peoples the outcome document reiterated, we were able to get this in there and all the countries committed to do this. However, it stayed undone. This is paragraph 27 again, call for a mechanism. It's where we could have a way to return our items, um, which doesn't exist yet. Uh, the permanent forum played a very key role after the adoption of the World Conference outcome document. Uh, they dedicated a three hour session to a consultation on international repatriation and how we could implement um, these cases. You can see, you know, we're up there on a panel, indigenous peoples from everywhere, uh, we, states, countries participated, because everyone saw this as a burning need. We cannot have our spiritual health, you know, without our sacred items um, returned and, and including our ancestral remains. Out of that conference, I was invited to speak at UNESCO. 
um, in 2016, because that's the body, the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization that would supposedly advance this new mechanism. So I was, I was asked to present, and in particular, present the case that we've always used as the core example is the possession by the National Museum of um, Sweden in Stockholm of our sacred deer head or Masakova, one of the most sacred items for the Yaki nation. It was taken by prisoners of war. The expert mechanism on rights of indigenous peoples, um, you can see Kristen there and I'm there, a Mexican government participated with us. Uh, talk to us about how we could utilize the process at the expert mechanism called country engagement to bring our Yaqui cultural leaders and political leaders together with the government of Sweden, led by and coordinated by the International Nin Treaty Council to begin to put pressure on them. It took us 19 years for them to realize that we are, we're never gonna let this go. We would keep raising it everywhere we went. Um, they, out of this process, was born an expert seminar on international repatriation in Vancouver, Canada, March 2021. That's our tribal chairman sitting next to me, Peter Yucupicio, and Yaki cultural leaders uh, from both the Mexico and Arizona side. We came together on these issues across the border. We were able to get a resolution adopted at the UN Human Rights Council calling for the establishment of a new mechanism for international repatriation of sacred items and human remains based on this work that we were doing for the return of our sacred item as well as implementing um, through the permanent forum and the MRIP um, the call by the UN declaration. Finally, because of the permanent forum meeting last year, where the government of Sweden, the museum had already agreed because of all this pressure to return the item, but they still had not done so. Last April, the government of Mexico, the president of the expert mechanism on rights of indigenous peoples, the UN special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, all talked in the permanent forum and demanded that Sweden return this item after 19 years. After the session, I, the government of, of Sweden representative was waiting for me outside the hall and said, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. So in June of last year, we all went um, to uh, Sweden, to Stockholm, Sweden. This is the home of the ambassador of the government of Mexico and signed an agreement for the official return of our sacred Masakova. We don't take pictures of it, but the government of Sweden, the museum had a picture of the Masakova used in our deer dance. And for us, this item is alive once it's been in the ceremony. First time I ever talked to the curator of the museum back uh, in 2003, I told him the, this Masakova is a political prisoner. It's like seeing a child in a cage is how we felt. So that's something that, that I just want to show you that because it shows you that you can use these bodies to make a concrete difference for your peoples and your nations. This year's theme, and they have a key theme, is Indigenous peoples, human health, planetary and territorial health, and climate change, a rights-based approach. This is uh, demonstrating um, in Guatemala against a mine. Some of the key articles that you can highlight is free prior informed consent and development, Article 32, the right to health and traditional health related practices, Article 24 of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the international standing of treaties. Uh, Article 37, very hard fought and important language. This is just one example of mercury contamination of uh, fish that violates the right uh, to food and right to fish of treaties. I'm almost done. I think this is my last slide and I know I'm probably over time, but um, I just want to comment that um, ways you can participate. This is our one of our young people from Pine Ridge Reservation, Oglala Lakota, talking about the mining and uh, the contamination of the groundwater there. Uh, she'll be there again this year, uh, Ampo Jensen. 
um, is to make statements, uh, understand the role of the secretariat uh, of the permanent forum. They can be very helpful. Talk to the countries you're from. Like I said, approach the United States. Or if you want to talk to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, approach them. Ask them when's a good time to sit outside and have coffee. Um, talk to the permanent forum members. Like I said, we have one here in a moment. Uh, focus on the theme and other themes. Understand the program of work and where you can make statements. Um, if you don't get to speak, okay, because there's a lot of people on the speakers list, the chair will go um, in between uh, a, a country, an indigenous speaker and a UN agency. They'll skip around regions, look and see where you are on the speakers list, but be aware the state that the chair may not stick to the speakers list because he's trying to get he or she, you know, regional balance, et cetera. Do not leave the room if you're on the speakers list for that agenda item. Use the restroom before or after, or just wait. Because I've seen so many times people be called on, they're not in the room, and they're not going to have time. There's too many on the list to come back and pick you up again. So practice your speech. It can't be more than three minutes. Read it to somebody out loud. Um, make sure you're not going too fast. The translators won't be able to keep up with you and they'll, they, the chair will interrupt you if you're speaking too fast. You don't want that to happen. Um, meet with your state. Focus on one or two key recommendations. Don't put like 10 recommendations. The point is to try to get your recommendation into the report of the permanent forum. I think um, Jeffrey is gonna talk about how you do that. Even if you don't get to read, or even if you do, don't worry, take your recommendation and give it to one of the members of the permanent forum or to the rapporteur. Um, good luck, you can influence the results. And this body, as I showed you, and I could give you a lot more examples than that, but that's I wanted to give you that one because it means so much to my own nation. But by doing this, we were able to advance a process that many indigenous nations and peoples can benefit from as well through the permanent forum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Carmen, for that uh, wonderful presentation, all that fantastic information. It's great to hear about the Masakova example because that really does clearly highlight all the different levels of advocacy, all the different arenas that you're working in and that are necessary to work in um, to effectively move things forward over time. So thank you for sharing that with us. And also I really appreciated, um, oh, and let me go ahead and say that um, Ms. Car to the audience, Ms. Carmen has offered that we could make her slides available. So don't worry if you weren't able to capture all that information, we'll, we'll send that out to everyone uh, or post that on our website. We'll let you know where that's available um, after, after we're done. But um, so much practical information too about the three minute statement, um, keeping that tied to the agenda. And I think we could um, pop in the chat, uh, Mason, if you would, the um, a link to the uh, program for the session. So folks can look at that and see uh, the speakers list opportunities and, um, and how their issues can be tied in with, with the agenda. Um, I also wanted to mention that the um, you you mentioned that we would be on TV when we're delivering these statements, and I wanted to let folks know that even though this session isn't available in a hybrid format, you can follow live um, the whole well all the open sessions on the UN Web TV. So Mason just put that link in the chat as well, and I think that's correct that all the um, I don't know if the recording is available or if it's only live. I'm not sure about that, but um, maybe <laughs> maybe someone here, one of our experts, can let us know about that. I think it's I think it's supposed to be live. Okay, live. Okay, so follow live uh, on the um, on the link that Mason provided. So thank you. Um, now, and oh, also just to let folks know, we are having the Q&A session coming up uh, following our last speaker, and we're moving to him now. 
Uh, next, we have the privilege to hear from a current member of the UN Permanent Forum, Jeffrey Roth, who, whose Lakota Sioux has devoted his career to the advocacy of Indigenous rights in diverse sectors. He's currently providing advice on policy and legislative strategies for tribes and urban Indian organizations. Mr. Roth recently co-founded Inaji, an Indigenous-led technology company providing culturally competent solutions to improve American Indian and Alaska Native health care. Former President Barack Obama appointed Mr. Roth in 2010 to serve in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Indian Health Service, which is responsible for the allocation of a $6 billion federal appropriation for American Indian and Alaska Native health care. During this appointment, Mr. Roth advised executive management of IHS, led the implementation of the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, and collaborated with HHS leadership on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Prior to that, Mr. Roth served as the executive director of the National Council of Urban Indian Health, representing community-based indigenous health centers in cities across the United States. During his tenure, he was integral in ensuring the continuation of the urban Indian health program within IHS and also securing policy gains in the ACA and IHCIA for urban and all indigenous peoples in the US. Mr. Roth also served as the president of the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center and represented the US in the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV and AIDS. Mr. Roth is a fierce advocate for his people in health, education, and self-determination. So I look forward to hearing from Mr. Roth about the upcoming session of the Permanent Forum and his insights from the perspective of a Permanent Forum member about how we can be most effective in our engagement there. So I turn it over to you, Mr. Roth. Great. Thank you very much. Gosh, it's always hard to hear uh, your uh, bio. I, I, it's, I cringe. I don't want to be on camera. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm really happy to be here, and I really wanted to thank um, um, everyone for putting this uh, session on. I, I, it's, I was telling them earlier, I've been using all the emails and sending them out to people that have been asking me about how to register and how to get ready for the session. So I really appreciate this. And I also really appreciate hearing from uh, Chief Barnes and uh, Andrea about uh, the tips and advice. It's been very helpful for me, and I've learned a lot um, from, um, from them. You know, um, I, I'm going to quickly talk about the theme uh, this year um, and um, then about a member report that I would, uh, was part of writing um, and then a bit about uh, insight on the process and the, the final report. Um, although we had some good advice already from, uh, from both of uh, the chief and, and Andrea. Um, one strategy I, I would say that I that I would uh, I was going to say that Andrea demonstrated uh, perfectly is to when given a chance talk about the issues that are important to you um, and and so I I found that as well so I'm going to talk a little bit about my issue as well uh, health um, so uh, as Andrea said you know the permanent forum it's an advisory board to the ECOSOC which is the Economic and Social Council of the UN established in 2000. Uh, and like she said, all of these advisory groups have mandates, and the mandate specifically for the Permanent Forum is to discuss Indigenous people's issues related to economic and social de development, culture, education, environment, health, and human rights. Um, uh, again, we're a 16-member group. We have eight of us are nominated by Indigenous organizations. I'm nominated by an indigenous organization and eight are from member states or governments. Right now we have members from um, Burundi, Denmark, Chad, Canada, China, the Ukraine, Nambia, Australia, Colombia, Myanmar, Chile, Russia. There's two members from Iran and two members from uh, the United States, me and former ambassador Harper. Uh, and again, all decisions must be um, made by con consensus. So the objectives in, in my mind for, for this annual session are really to address as best as possible the concerns of indigenous people brought to the forum, uh, to ensure that we provide recommendations through ECOSOC to the UN agencies and to the member states from 
uh, indigenous peoples uh, to work to promote assurances that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is respected uh, for all of its protections, uh, to provide a voice for those that cannot in a system, a UN system that can have tremendous influence depending on where indigenous peoples live, to promote uh, integration of indigenous peoples' voices into the UN system at all levels. And personally, I intend to bring attention to a subject that has not had as much attention as I had hoped over the years of the forum, uh, and that is health of our indigenous people. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So I'm really enthusiastic about the theme this year. We worked hard to get it and to work to ensure that we have the most of this theme. Again, the theme is indigenous peoples, human health, planetary and territorial health, and climate change, a rights-based approach. And from the name, you can see that it involves multiple aspects of life because, you know, as indigenous people, we approach life holistically and we seek equilibrium uh, with spirituality, traditional medicine, biodiversity, and all of the interconnectedness that exists. You know, I've been preparing during the last year to focus on creating initiatives that can lead to tangible outcomes and actionable tools for local indigenous leaders to advance their needs. To me, this is the most valuable thing we can do uh, at the international level. Always keep an eye and a focus on how we connect with indigenous peoples on the ground. Uh, we also want to educate you know, our national and international agency officials on how to appropriately uh, approach any kind of work that would engage or involve indigenous people. So one of the tools that we worked on this past year was the Permanent Forum member report. I was lucky enough to be uh, able to have a, a report with two other Permanent Forum um, members. And uh, I also worked with 19 uh, indigenous scholars and allies to create this report on indigenous determinants of health. Uh, that is uh, speaking uh, in terms of the specific circumstances that impact the health of indigenous peoples, either as a protective factor or as a risk factor. More importantly, I also saw this as an opportunity to educate agency officials, both at the national and international level, on the facts that our indigenous issues must not be grouped together with other minority issues. We see this across the UN uh, system. One, because indigenous communities have a holistic approach and thus make decisions in a completely different manner than dominant or minority uh, populations. Um, another reason is that you know, the issues of colonization and neo-colonization are different from um, for indigenous communities than for migrant or vulnerable population or refugee populations. And, and three, you know, given the increasing number of minorities and uh, their growing numbers, indigenous issues often become invisible when grouped with other populations. Um, thus, either for health or for any other indigenous related issue, we need to make sure that decision makers and professionals working with our communities understand that important dif difference. Um, we ensure that uh, educational tools exist for indigenous leaders to use when trying to elevate their issues. And this is how I think of this report that we created um, to uh, provide the, the work uh, needed and, and a framework to reach local indigenous communities globally. Um, I have to say that it's been a year of educating about the topic on indigenous determinants of health. And so I wanna take just a minute to talk about it. Uh, you know, the report is titled Indigenous Determinants of Health uh, and the 2030 Agenda. Again, the purpose of the report is to define the topic for the field and for the WHO and other UN agencies and provide a guide for member states to address the health disparities that exist in their territories. So we worked with indigenous individuals from six of the seven sociocultural regions of uh, the permanent forum. We had a great writing group. Um, the, uh, in writing the report, we worked closely with the uh, WHO Office of Social Determinants of Health. Um, they are in the process of revising their landmark report, uh, originally uh, published almost 20 years ago, 
on social determinants of health. And we'll be re-releasing -re that uh, for the first time in seven years um, coming up in the next couple of months. They were uh, nice enough to co collaborate with us closely, provided us an advanced copy of their draft and so we were able to map our indigenous determinants of health along to the WHO social determinants of health. So there's a more logical way for the agency and, and, and uh, member states to think about. Uh, they've also agreed to provide a summary of our indigenous determinants of health report in their upcoming report on the social determinants of health. And we're very excited to see that as well. So specifically, the indigenous determinants of health are social, economic, cultural, and environmental factors that contribute to the health outcomes of indigenous people. These determinants are shaped by historical and ongoing colonization, discrimination and marginalization, which have resulted in inequitable access to resources, services and opportunities. The, uh, this framework recognizes that indigenous peoples have distinct cultural identities, languages and ways of life that are closely tied to health and well-being. Addressing these determinants requires a comprehensive approach that acknowledges the unique experiences and perspectives of indigenous people, not just minority communities. Some of the key indigenous determinants of health include access to land and resources, cultural continuity, self-determination, language and culture, education, income, and employment. These uh, determinants are interconnected and have complex relationships with health outcomes. For example, the loss of traditional lands and resources can lead to a loss of cultural continuity and identity, which can have a negative impact on our mental and, spirit and physical and spiritual health. Uh, similarly, discrimination and unequal access to education and employment opportunities can lead to poverty and limited access to healthcare which can further exacerbate health disparities. Um, so we have split the uh, report into three main areas. The first area um, being intergenerational holistic healing. The third be, being speaking specifically about the environment and uh, the interaction with uh, health of indigenous people. We've na named that the health of mother earth. And um, actually I, I smiled a bit when I heard Chief Bards uh, say about um, Reindigenizing. Uh, the title of the third is Decolonizing and Reindigenizing Culture as a Determinative of Health. So I really appreciated his comments there. Um, we are planning on launching this report on uh, April 18th. So that's the second day of the forum. Um, and we have had uh, um, interest and in, we'll have a journal article in the journal The Lancet uh, uh, talking about what are some of the next steps. Uh, in regards uh, to the topic. We'll also be hosting a side event that will take place on the 18th, and we'll have individuals that collaborated on the report from Johns Hopkins University, National Indian Health Board, Aramat Project, University of Auckland, and the Global Youth Caucus. So this engagement with the WHO is new for uh, the current generation of employees and so at, at the WHO. And so they have been uh, meeting with a group of us um, almost monthly on our concerns. And I, it's been a, a productive year. One of the outcomes of those meetings is that they are gonna be hosting two side events this year at the Permanent Forum. The first event specifically is on indigenous people's mental health, which will take place April 20th from eight to 9.30 AM, not a great time. Um, and uh, the event is specifically exploring possible interventions to address the root causes of indigenous people's mental health pro problems, including through the full recognition and exercise of indigenous people's collective rights and self-determination. Uh, this was put on by the Department of Mental Health at the WHO, as well as the uh, Department for Gender Diversity, Equity and Human Rights. The second session they're gonna do is on indigenous women's maternal health. That will take place on Tuesday, April 18th from 8 to 9.30 a.m. And the event explores existing interventions, tools, and methodologies being used by different actors to address the existing barriers towards improving indigenous maternal health. And again, this is uh, uh, sponsored by the same 
um, organizations and also including the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health at uh, the WHO headquarters. So another issue we have been collaborating with the WHO team on is Indigenous people's participation in the World Health Assembly that will be coming up in 2023. Last month, uh, Brazil indicated that it would be offering a resolution on Indigenous people's health, um, spe specifically stating that Indigenous people's health is a human right, and so is the ability to self-govern our, uh, our healthcare systems. Um, it also, the resolution will also call for a, a health plan on a global health plan on indigenous people's health. Um, the authors group that uh, I worked with on the indigenous determinants of health uh, is remaining active and wants to continue advocating for these issues. So during the permanent forum session this year uh, and during our uh, side event, we're going to be um, where we launched the report, we're going to be calling for a few things. One of the things that we want to call for with the WHO is a high-level Indigenous work group to consult with the WHO Director General, specifically on Indigenous health. We also want to call for a site event at the World Health Assembly specific on specifically on Indigenous people's health in order to help one, pass the resolution uh, that Brazil is going to be uh, proposing, uh, but also educate the member states uh, on how to best approach our populations. And we're also calling for a work group meeting to occur in the next year to help create this um, plan that the uh, Brazil resolution is calling for. So I, I was also asked to talk a little bit about the process over the next two weeks uh, of the forum. And um, you, you know, from a permanent forum member's perspective, you know, we have a final report to produce with recommendations that align with every single session of the agenda. So most of our time is spent uh, summarizing and writing uh, sections to go into this final report. We have strict deadlines when all of these recommendations are due, both to our rapporteur and then to the UN itself to be get translated. Everything has to be ready and translated for the last day when we adopt this uh, report. Uh, we are also on a size limitation. We only have a certain number of words. 8,500 words is, is the length of uh, the report. So we're each assigned to uh, different sessions, or, or I, I would say we volunteered to be assigned to different um, sessions, you know, my sessions, I'll let you know specifically, my sessions include um, the discussion on the special theme. So I will be creating the section uh, on, or co-creating the session on the special theme, um, um, as well as um, 5C, which is the dialogue with UN agencies, funds and programs. Um, I'll also be uh, creating, along with uh, Keith Harper, the uh, regional dialogue for North America section as well as dialogue with member states. Um, those, the, the UN agencies section and the member states section is, is usually not open to um, indigenous participants uh, as, as an FII. Um, so we have a strict deadlines to adhere to in order to, to get everything complete. And I would say, you know, the best way, as Andrea was saying, to assist us in this report writing is and to ensure that your issues are covered is to provide us text and recommendations, uh, most helpful. I'll put my email in the chat here, and I'll be happy to, to take any of your um, uh, recommendations specifically. If you want to send me your testimony, that's great, but if you could really pull out any specific recommendations or language that you're proposing to go in the re report, I'd really appreciate that. And, and also when you're doing that, make sure to include what agenda topic this should fall under, even if it's not one of my assigned agenda topics, I'll be able to send it to the assigned permanent forum members. And then also if and when the, uh, the issue that you're addressing was mentioned in the forum. One of the things that they are emphasizing this year is to make sure that whatever is in the report had to have been said in some form during uh, the session uh, itself. Um, and we'll work to include that, um, again, space, space is limited. Um, um, there, there are people that are very good at sending us uh, those recommendations, and, and we want to make sure that we can get them all. Um, one other thing to remember when um, talking about uh, the member reports, 
um, and, and this is a, an interesting thing to think about is that you know these reports are really uh, preparing language um, for non-Indigenous individuals to implement. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that these are most likely non-Indigenous people that are working with member states or that are working at UN agencies. And so I think that's just important to think about how you address things and how you frame, uh, frame things that our audience is potentially our typical audience. So with the deadline uh, and the side events, it's a little difficult, I think, to engage with members, um, but you know, we're in the sessions. Um, we are, are, are able to, to talk. Um, uh, you know, we may be able to step out at some points. Um, there's also potentially uh, short times between meetings. Um, but um, you know, another opportunity, I think, is at the um, side events that permanent forum members will be participating in. Um, you, you know, you might want to look at their description or look at their concept notes and see if permanent forum members are on those, either as, um, as expert members or as, uh, you know, I'm doing a couple of wrap-ups for side events. Um, that might be another good way to interact. Um, um, you know, I, I would also, like Andrea said, I guess you don't have to go too into this, is that I would really encourage you to talk to the member state representative sitting um, at the U.S. Um, a table. I actually, just before this, had a call with uh, the White House, and I was really asking them to work to get uh, our American Indian Alaska Native uh, political appointees to the session to be able to sit at the desk and to participate. I know we did that in the Obama administration and haven't done it in a while, so I was putting that request in. I know it's a little late for the government, but we'll see what they can pull off or if they can pull anything off. Um, and I'd also like to encourage you, like Andrea said, is to engage with the UN agency staff. They will all be sitting in seats that are labeled for them. So all the member states have their labels of what state uh, or what uh, nation they're from. Uh, there's also a section for indigenous peoples representatives and then a section for um, UN agency staff, and they'll be there as well. Um, again, the final report is gonna be adopted on the last day by the forum members in that report. We'll have all of the recommendations from the forum this year and the different agenda items. We'll also have uh, the theme that we agree upon as members uh, for the, the session. Um, and we'll also identify um, an expert um, member, uh, expert member reports for next year. We're allowed to do two expert member reports. So we will, I'm gonna try and put in a bid for that as well. And, um, uh, the expert group meetings, which is a meeting that happens about midway through the year, um, that theme will also be identified. So again, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat, and I'm also happy to answer any questions you may have, and I, I really appreciate uh, your time. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roth, for that fantastic information. It really highlights to me, and I hope for everyone, um, the uh, level of access that folks have when they are attending Permanent Forum. Um, just the thought that we can take our, um, our requests for recommendations and give them to you, you know, and, and perhaps then see them reflected in actual recommendations in the report, um, the final report that gets approved. Um, it, uh, it's fantastic to be able to, um, to engage that way. Uh, and then also to highlight the points that you made about in, uh, engaging with other actors who are there, the member states, the UN agencies, and, and those opportunities. And thanks so much for sharing with us the information about the report that you've worked on and also the, just the way that the final report of the session comes together and that it has to be by consensus, um, as uh, Ms. Carmen pointed out, uh, eight of the members are selected by states. So um, these are, you know, it has to be a recommendation that can be agreed by both the indigenous um, selected or, or nominated representatives and then also the um, state selected members as well. So um, really, really great information. Um, and Here, I forgot just one thing, if I could say, uh, I see the question about Secretary Holland. Secretary Holland is slated to be there uh, for the opening on um, Monday, as well as the Secretary General, we've told, is also supposed to be there unless something pulls them away. 
So I, I don't think that, I know that doesn't happen very often. And so we're also excited that the Secretary General is going to show up. So thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for that information. And uh, uh, something else that I think I heard last week on the um, uh, workshop that I mentioned uh, that Ms. Carmen had participated in, be there early to get a good seat, right? Especially for for that opening that's going to be really exciting so um don't wait till 11 to show up <laughs> to get your seat there so thank you I, I know we have folks who are um wanting to ask some questions and so let's see i'm i'm not so sure i'm good at seeing the raised hands i may need to ask mason to help me identify folks certainly sue can you hear me okay yes Wonderful. First, we have Chase Velasquez. Chase, okay. I'm going to give you speaking permissions. Let me know when you can hear it or try speaking. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chase Velasquez. I'm the attorney for the St. Carlos Apache tribe. And not so much a, a question, I guess more of a an FYI comment. So the St. Carlos Apache tribe, as some may know, uh, has is involved with litigation against the United States regarding sacred site protection. Um, there's an area called Oak Flat that is managed by the U.S. Forest uh, Service Program. Uh, and Congress passed a law back in 2015 that basically authorizes the transfer of federal public land that the tribe has hailed as central to their traditional cultural religious beliefs since time immemorial. And the tribe has continued to oppose this transfer for purposes of mining activities to Resolution Copper, which is jointly owned by two companies, uh, I believe in Europe. So the St. Carlos Apache tribe is now going to attend the forum in New York. I'll be uh, attending with Chairman Terry Ramler, uh, Vice Chairman Tail Epison, and the Tribes Attorney General Alexander Ritchie. Uh, our presence is to beef up international pressure on the United States, but also to uh, you seek uh, unification with all indigenous groups to further echo their concerns on how activities like this by states not protecting human rights of indigenous peoples is, a, is an issue that St. Carlos shares as well within the United States. So we will be attending to have our presence known. And with that, I am going to do everything I can. And I would ask for any help to where we can get Chairman Ramler uh, placed on a speaker's list within the three minute a lot of time. So I just wanted to let the group know that St. Cross Apache Tribe will be there. Um, I have done some work before, but you know, to be honest, I'm still new to this. I'm still learning. There's a lot of moving pieces international level. So if you do see us, please say hello. And if I ask for help, you know, I would greatly appreciate your help. But we are registered. So we look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Velasquez, for sharing that information. And it's great to hear that you'll have um, that delegation there. I see that Ms. Carmen has raised her hand and I was gonna call on you. So that's perfect. Um, so please. Okay, thank you. Hello, Chase. Um, I'm sure we've met down here in, in uh, Arizona, but um, it's important to recognize and, and we you know dig digging about this because we thought um, that the last couple of years, well, last year was a mixed session, hybrid, they call it, right? With both in-person statements and uh, virtual statements. Uh, the two years before that was all virtual because of COVID. Um, but we had hoped in a way that they would maintain at least part of it, which was to allow uh, for advanced registration um, online to make statements under each agenda items. But we're informed and in the training that we do, we have to pass this on, that all of the registration to make statements will be in the room. 
And usually what they do is they open up the registration for a certain agenda item, um, the session before, and people get in line. You know, it's back to that primitive <laughs> system of getting in line. You have to make copies of your statement. We say 17. Uh, when you register, you have to have those with you. Um, DOSIP will be there. So there will be place to make copies inside um, the UN session and um, just ask around where DOSIP, which is a, um, a non-Indigenous organization that assists all of us with this kind of thing is making copies or you know, lending computers, et cetera. Um, they're pretty important. Or you can make your copies outside, but you'll need to have those copies with you when you sign up. And <clears throat> they're mainly for the interpreters so that they can follow along with you. And remember, don't read too fast. So when you practice your three minute statement, a lot of people wanna get as much as they can in there. And what happens is they'll interrupt you and say, the, the interpreters can't keep up with you if you're going too fast. Also, I recommend you keep your paper down on the desk. You know, they're gonna be calling, calling on you. Take three nice deep breaths to calm yourself so you're not out of breath. Raise your hand so the camera and um, the chair knows where you are. Push your button, which will turn on your mic and they'll turn it on when it's time for you to speak. But um, I've, I've seen people trying to read calmly, but they're so nervous. And I, you will be nervous. I'm nervous and I've done this a million years, right? They're rattling their papers, you know, and you can hear that in the mic, but practice and read slowly. Um, not too slowly, medium speed, but so the interpreters can keep up with you so you're not interrupted. And so half the people in the room don't miss what you're saying because it's the interpretation is going to be simultaneous and live of your statements. So, uh, but make sure that you sign up because there'll be so many people, there's not going to be a chance once the agenda item starts to, you know, sign up to speak. So I'm just giving you that advice to make your best shot at um, being able to give a statement. And um, I hope that you can, but don't worry if you can't. If Chairman Rambler, who I know well, um, is not able to speak, as Jeff said, you know, still, you know, take that recommendation and provide it um, to Jeffrey or to the rapporteur or to another member of the permanent forum. Um, so the most important thing is to get your issue um, into the report. They will not put, as I said, individual issues, but they will put, you know, the general issue of protection of sacred sites as a key essential element to protect our health, uh, spiritual, physical, environmental health, something like that could go in the recommendations very easily. There you go, Jeffrey, I just gave you one. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you, Andrea, for that. And, um, you know, we were speaking earlier before the webinar started, things maybe are a little different this year with the speakers list. There's a schedule that's provided. If you go to the permanent forum uh, session website and pull down the speakers list button, you know, um, there's information in there. There's a link to um, a schedule. So, um, it, it's not crystal clear, I don't think, um, about how to do that, but um, certainly all those very good points about being aware, being having your eye on the schedule, keep staying informed, checking that website, right, to see is there any new information about speakers list. Um, with the schedule that they have right now, for example, it says uh, for the special theme of the session that um, uh, Mr. Ross spoke about the health um, theme of the session. You register for the speakers list Monday, April 17, 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. But you want to be the 3.30 p.m. or the 3.25 standing there waiting <laughs> person, right, um, to, to get on the list. So um, do, do monitor things very closely. Make sure that you're um, signing up when, when you need to. And um, Another question, uh, Ms. Carmen, is, is it helpful, does it elevate your chances of being called on to speak if it's a, um, like a multi-tribe or a multi-organization 
um, statement. So we're we want to sign up for speakers list, but it's it's not just NARF. It's NARF and NCAI and International Indian Treaty Council and you know uh, whoever else wants. Is that helpful to do it that way? Absolutely, it is. Um, there are some organizations like IATC and others that are considered umbrellas because we have so many affiliates from some of nations from so many different regions. Our board president will be there. He represents treaties one through 11 in Canada on our board and, and as an affiliate, that's 243 individual treaty nations in Canada. So we're for those kinds of reasons, we're considered an umbrella or a joint, uh, but it absolutely does improve your chances of speaking if you're signing up as a joint um, statement you know, with several and, and um, they have to be, just to be clear, they have to be organizations, tribes or entities that are uh, registered at the permanent forum. And you have to speak, you'll be called on to speak by the organization that or nation or network that credentialed you. So you may be, you know, credentialed by NAR for NCAI. And the, when you speak, you can say, and I'm also delivering this, um, this statement on behalf of the Pasco Yaki tribe or, you know, et cetera. You know, you can throw, if you, that's part of your three minutes, you know, but um, that's, we're going to have a couple like that where they're under it. International and Treaty Council, but they're also going to be saying their own representation, which is important, of course, to all of us. So, but you have to be speaking under the and sign up to speak under the organization um, that provided you with the credential. And just so you know that, and that's been some, you know, a problem before because people just didn't know. Don't forget to have your copies with you. Otherwise, you're going to have to leave and leave your place in line and, and come back. The speakers list will be posted, but people get frustrated because the chair does not have to stick to the speakers list. They're going to be looking at alternating, as I said, country statements. They just get three minutes also. Um, last year, I was so proud of our chair, who I think is fantastic. They might choose a different one this year, Dario Mejia from Indigenous Representative from Colombia. He told the states they did not have a right to reply. A right to reply is something like the Human Rights Council. The U.S. used it against us once. The only time in all the 40 years we've been there, they used it at the permanent forum in a statement we made about Leonard Peltier. And it was a big mistake because 10 organizations afterwards <laughs> spoke in favor of our statement, which I think they just kind of put that in there. But um, last year, the big issue was, of course, the war in Russia. And Russia actually complained to ECOSOC. I don't know, Jeffrey, if you were listening to when Dario did the report, them, India and Indonesia complained they didn't have a right to reply. And Dario said that this body can make its own rules of procedure. It doesn't have to stick to that rule, which means if someone criticizes a country, the country gets to immediately raise their hand and contest what they say. Uh, but the permanent forum, he said, doesn't have to stick to that. And ECOSOC backed him up, you know, the Economic and Social Council. So that was the first chair of the permanent forum I've ever seen say that to states. Sign up for the speakers list, make your three minute statement that's available to the countries, but you don't have a right to reply. They can't contest what we say if we want to, you know, name a human rights violator in our statement. So I thought that was, you know, that was the first time ever that so, that has been stuck to. Anyway, uh, I, I was chairing during the Indonesian uh, issue <laughs> where the <laughs> indigenous people uh, went from Indonesia and boy, you start getting a ton of pressure from the secretariat office and from, because all the UN staff freak out that the member states are mad and, and <laughs> you have to be strong up there. So yeah, I really appreciate Donna saying, nope, not going to happen. So it was great. He's, he was great. Wonderful. Thank you um, for that. And Mason, can you identify our next uh, question? Yes, uh, I see we have Leonard Gorman's hand up. Uh, I'm going to give those speaking permissions now. Thank you. Hi. Um, the, I think part of the uh, 
important part of this session is going to be meeting with delegates from these nation states. As, as, the, as the rhythm of this discussion and the purpose of the forum is advisory category. While it's great to see a part of this, these issues that indigenous peoples from the United States become a part of this advisory. Um, it is a long, long, decades after decades of wait to see results. Um, so that's why I think it's also very important to, to meet with the delegates that are there from the nation states, particularly United States. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, this whole session uh, takes time. So if those people, if Holland is going to be there, I, I would strongly recommend, and I'm hoping that Chase Velasquez would be able to connect with my office, uh, Navajo Nation Human Rights Office, uh, to foster some level of uh, a meeting with Holland if she's going to be there um, on these sacred site issues and how it pertains to, as, as Carmen put it, um, the medicinal plants that grow on these sacred sites. So I don't know exactly who would be those individuals on the ground uh, from these agencies such as uh, University of Colorado that can facilitate these kinds of meetings. Um, I'd rather go away having had the chance to meet with somebody such as Holland in, in this session. Does anybody have any idea? So, I mean, I just, as, as much as I know about the secretary's schedule is that she'll be there for the day. Uh, I don't know what the plan is for her for the day, but I, I know she will, is supposed to be giving uh, introductory remarks during the opening session. I don't know what she'll be doing during uh, the um, um, afternoon session. Um, so so I, I'm not sure if she'll be taking meetings or not. I'm sure she could probably get a room if she wanted to. Um, I would probably reach out to um, BIA maybe um, and, and uh, or, or the secretary's office and see if there's any way to get on her calendar. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see Andrea's hand up. Is that a new hand or is that... It's a new hand just in response to this question. Hi, Leonard. I, I quote you a lot. And when I, I just did, I think for the project access training, you know, and when I just wanted to say that, that and maybe it's an inspiration to all of us on how to do this work. Um, after we had the uh, official uh, country visit of Jim and I, a Special Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples to the United States, and he made some great recommendations and we, all of the um, indigenous representatives and organizations and nations that had helped put together the hearings met uh, at U of A afterwards, University of Arizona with Jim to kind of assess, evaluate, you know, how, the success. And, and Leonard said, and I'm sorry, I'm getting the quote wrong, Leonard, but it's so good. I use it a lot. Um, said, you know, I, we have these great recommendations. We had all of these hearings all over from Alaska, South Dakota, you know, Navajo Nation and everywhere in between. Um, and, but yet I, I was thinking, but where's the teeth in this process? How are they gonna make these, the US do these things? And then I realized, you know, we're the teeth. We are the teeth. And I, I think I tried to show that when I showed what we did for the return of our sacred Masakova using the UN. But if if the Yaquis hadn't been persistent and kept this up, you know, this would have never happened. I know Leonard spoke briefly the year that um, our tribal chairman, Peter Yucopicio, was at, at the permanent forum to address this issue, you know, too. But I, I think um, regarding that, the, the US will always meet with tribal leaders and uh, tribal organizations from the U.S. at U.N. sessions. 
we do this at climate change. We do, somebody just has to spearhead and maybe Jeffrey would be a good person to do that. I don't know if Deb Holland will be there still, but the US State Department is the international representative, unlike Interior or BIA, um, that attends these sessions. And you know we should have that nation to nation treaty relationship with the State Department. Um, and maybe Jeffrey, you could spearhead that discussion to set up um, a dialogue. You know, it could be at lunch or you know whenever uh, or in the morning with um, the United States government that would be open to the tribal leaders there because we do this at every UN body almost, and they they're happy to do it. Someone just needs to organize it, approach them. Well, thank, thank you so much um, for that. Um, I see that we're coming up on the end of our time. We um, So there's a question from Jenna Waldman in the chat. Um, Jenna, if you could reach out to us after, we'll um, get back to you on that. Um, so Mason, if you could make sure she has our uh, email information. Um, this has been so wonderful, and I feel like we've only sort of scratched the surface. There's so much. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, if you're not there this year, come next year, and um, let's all do this together uh, at Permanent Forum, all this great advocacy work, and, and learn how to make the most effective use of this uh, mechanism that's available to us. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things. So um, we understand that the State Department is having a reception. Uh, we heard from them at the recent State Department roundtable that there's going to be a reception Monday evening. I, I haven't seen an invitation to that, so I don't have those details, but keep an eye out for, for that. And then NCAI is having a tribal leaders reception on Tuesday evening, um, April 25th. Um, so uh, if you haven't received the invitation for that, please reach out to us about that so we can get you that information. Uh, then also the implementation project is doing uh, a series of side events or sponsoring or co-sponsoring a series of side events. And we'll also share information about those. We have two that will be in person at Permanent Forum and one that's going to be virtual. Um, so even if you won't be attending Permanent Forum, in person, you can um, join our side event, and that's going to be on April 26th, the virtual side event. But we'll give all the all the details and information about how to register for those. So, um, Kristen, do you have any more remarks before we close? Thanks, Sue, and thank you very much to Chief Barnes and Andrea and Jeff. This is really incredible information, and it's also just a terrific time for some of us to become acquainted as people from the US, from indigenous communities and advocates and allies to get together. And I, I hope that we'll do that as much as possible when we're there in New York. And um, there is the interactive dialogue with the US and Canada the second week. I think Jeff mentioned that. That's also a good already existing time to talk directly to the United States. And I remember at the meeting last year, Jeff was very supportive of me when I was making some pointed comments to the US at that meeting, and those did end up in the report. So um, just to know that that's already in the structure, although of course I second any calls for um, additional meetings with our United States. Um, but again, I just wanna thank you all, and I, I know we're a little bit over time, but we'll see you all um, very, very shortly. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Take care.